Hi there. How is everyone? Good. So we all have a definition of success, right? I bet everyone in this room has probably a very different definition of success. In your personal life, well, I don't know, do that 10K. In your professional life, get that promotion. And we probably have a plan that goes along with that. And right, if we just execute the plan, we'll be awesome, right? We're successful. Right, I wish it was that easy. So that's clearly not what happens. And so many external things influence what success ends up being for us. The last couple of years have been kind of very interesting for me. I've had some influences that have permanently changed what my definition of success is. I'm a climber. I've been climbing for 27 years. It's been amazing. Um, I've had so many gifts from it. I met my husband, Terry, uh, 17 years ago, climbing Mount Shuxon up in Washington. Um, he was one of 14 guys, so obviously I found one of them. Chances. <laughs> He's still happy. It's a family event. My children climb. It's my son, Kieran. He was 11. He trekked to base camp with me. He was supposed to be here today, but his math tutor said, no way. So he is at math. So climbing has been such a big part of who I am. In 2013, I had the chance to, I was asked by one of the teams I've climbed with to climb Everest. And so I said, absolutely, sounds terrific. Climbing Everest takes about two months. It's a fairly long, arduous process. But if you've got the right team, things can really be amazing. About three weeks into this climb, I'm walking, walking, I wish, I was climbing through the Kumbu Icefall and I hit my arm off one of the ladders, didn't really notice it at the time, finally get up to camp two and that next morning I wake up and my arm is, I mean it looked like Popeye, from my elbow down to my fingertips the thing is huge. And as everybody in this room knows, altitude and swelling not a good combination. So I got down, I went back to base camp, helicopter, helicopter back to Kathmandu and spent the next five days working with the medical team down in Kathmandu to see what they really were concerned about, which is, did I have blood clots? And thankfully, I didn't. So at the end of sort of five days of therapy, the doctor says to me, you know, you, no real medical reason why you shouldn't actually go back. But you know what? You had a bit of trauma. Go climb something else, something a little less. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, people who climb mountains have egos. And if I wasn't going to climb Everest, I'm like, screw it, I'm going home. So I called my husband, Terry, and I was like, I I'm just coming home. It's not, it's not even worth it. So I flew to Hong Kong that night, and the five hours, that, that journey to Hong Kong was torture. I had all of these, I'm like, I think I've left too soon. I gave up on something that I could have done. So I got off that plane, rang my husband, I'm like, I'm going back. <laughs> I know, that's the crazy one, that's a different talk, we'll do that the next time. So I go through customs, I take a left, I buy another airline ticket, go back through customs, get on a plane back to Kathmandu, and I land 10 hours after I left. So I joined the team. So I go back. I trek back into base camp, and I rejoin the team. Things are great, and we're on what we call the summit push. And the summit push is the last two days. It's really usually at the end of the climb, and you go from base camp to camp two and four. Hopefully you summit safely. You come back down. So we're heading up to the summit. Something very interesting happens when you're close to there. It's like eight weeks in, so your adrenaline's flying. You're super excited. And it didn't feel amazing, but, you know, close to the summit. So I'm like, yeah. Until a point we had a break, and I checked my O2 sat. And when you're on four liters of oxygen, even at 27,000 feet, your O2 sat should not be 13%. So faced with a decision. Lots of us are faced with tough decisions, things we don't want to do, right? even if the answer is so obvious. And in that moment, I knew that I'd summit if I wanted to, but I would definitely die up there, so I decided to turn back. So one of the Sherpas and I turned around, and we went back to base camp. It took us about 14 hours to get back, and on the way down, that team summited, my team summited. I won't lie to you, kind of stung a little bit, but I finally got home, stung a little less. It was all good. But I did learn, right, I learned that lesson that you know the right thing to do when you know that right thing to do. When it's there facing you, do the right thing. Sometimes it'll save your life. So fast forward 2015. I get the second chance to go back to Everest. 
So April 25th, 2015 is when I have permanently changed what I consider success and that I enjoy the process and the journey every single day. And that big shiny goal, not it. On April 25th, 2015, a 7.8 earthquake hit Nepal. You probably all read about it. I was with eight other people in the Kumbu Icefall, and we were at this last technical section. So the Kumbu Icefall is incredibly dangerous, but it is the only passage on the south side. It's about uh, 4,000 feet of climbing, and we're at the last 50 feet. And it is a vertical ice wall. And you climb it by, you strap a bunch of ladders together, a bunch of cheap aluminum ladders together, and you fix them with ice screws, and you go as fast as you can. It's kind of, I know, very technical, but that's what you do. So I'm halfway up, about 25 feet up, and this earthquake has caused this avalanche to come ripping down the side, the west buttress of Everest on my left. And it's just feet from me. I just see it there. I'm sitting on this ladder, and this avalanche is coming. And then things are just, just, just crashing beneath us. If you've seen buildings implode from the bottom, that's all those pieces of ice around us. And this one wall we're standing on is fine. Everything else going. And then the earth starts shaking, and the ladder starts flying back and forth. And I'm thinking, oh my god, I hope whoever put those ice screws in is really talented, because this is all that's holding me here. But we got out. We got to the top of that ice wall, all of us. And it's been an incredible lesson. In the moment, I didn't think of it. But we were this, it's one of the best teams I've ever been on, because everyone knew their job. A lot of really experienced climbers on that team. We had amazing guides. And we all knew our job. So for the next two hours, we all did our job. No one panicked. No one freaked out. Everyone just did their job. So we got to Camp 1. And I knew when we walked into Camp 1, and I ran into David Bashir's. I knew nobody thought we were walking out of there. And when you have an amazing team and you're in the moment, you actually can. In this case, you can get out alive, but you can do extraordinary things. The last thing I remember seeing when I was standing on that ladder, we had passed a Korean team, probably eight, eight members of a team, about 30 minutes earlier. And when I looked to my right before I got off that ladder, I saw that team being just swept down the mountain. The avalanche took them. They haven't been found. Lots of people, especially my husband, have asked me what I was thinking. What was I thinking on that ladder? What flashed before my eyes? I know Terry thought it was him. It wasn't Terry. <laughs> I know. Don't tell him. And it wasn't actually even my children. In that moment, I was pissed. I was so pissed that in this moment, right now, out of my control, it was likely going to be over. And the naivety of that, I didn't, right, I didn't accept that it wasn't in my control. So many things outside of our lives, so many external influences that actually shape where we're going, they're not in our control. And oftentimes, just making friends with that, making friends with uncertainty, is a part of the journey. I think about this a lot at work, surprisingly. I think about this a lot at work. I think about when our clients come to Pebble, when our clients walk into labs and they see this thing. And I've seen them do it. They go, I, I want that. That thing, like, yeah, success, make that for me in my building. And I would challenge us all, are we deeply explaining what that is? That is an intensely complex, took many years, decades. The complexity beneath the cool veneer is what we actually need to explain is what success looks like. Because we want to make sure that when our clients actually do that, and they see this thing, that that thing becomes a real thing for them. No one person ever summits. No one person on their own ever summits. There's armies of people behind them. It takes 82 people, 82 people to get me to Everest in 2013 and 2015. And that's a small company, right? And it's the same in our own company. Anything you see, any tangible end outcome, there were armies of people behind that. And making sure that we recognize that, we understand the work that went into that, the process, 
and that we truly enjoy the process. We call it the daily grind. It's not just a climber's thing. I'm sure it's everybody's thing, right? The daily grind is this. You get up every day despite discomfort. And when you're on Everest, you sleep in a tent for two weeks. It's not that comfortable. It smells. There's no bathrooms, no showers. Food's different. But every single day you get up, and every single day you just deal with that day. You solve the problems of that day. You don't think about the summit. And sometimes you can't even think about the day. You just think about the hour ahead and you solve getting to the next rest stop. And solving these big, enormous challenges, thinking of these grand success ideas, they're solved in small ways. They're solved by getting your pack up every day, even if it's uncomfortable, and just looking ahead. And then over time, as you solve these problems, you look back and you see a trail of problems solved and a path forward. So finally, I hope for all of us, all of us at this company and all of us in our personal lives, that we really appreciate the process. We appreciate the journey. Whenever I talk about mountains, I never talk about a summit. I always talk about the eight weeks getting there and the friendships I made and the fun we had. We have an opportunity here at Pivotal to do the right thing for a huge amount of people. So let's make sure we do that. And the most important thing, and we did it on the mountain, we did it when we were scared getting to Camp One, is just have a laugh. It's the most important thing. That's success. Thank you.